afternoon. Thank you so much for the wait. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all for this afternoon's very special talk. My name is Jin Young Jin. I'm the director of uh, cultural programs at the Charles B. Wong Center. Um, we're very happy to join with the Stony Brook University Libraries in presenting today's very intriguing lecture entitled Nutritional Healing with Chinese Medicine. Today's lecture is supported in part by the Jacqueline and Newman Endowment Fund. And at this time of the year, uh, when temperatures start to drop, I personally take a lot of uh, ginger tea to avoid cold and the flus. And one of the basic principles of Chinese medicine is that food is the most powerful medicine for us. And I'm very enthusiastic about the uh, prospectus of learning today about the Asian Chinese wisdom and its uh, traditional traditions of healing through food. And I'm sure that all of you are here for the same reason. And um, I, I'm sure that you will enjoy a lot today. Uh, let me now invite Dr. Shafiq Fazal to introduce the library's Chinese cookbook collection gifted by uh, Dr. Newman and our guest speaker, Ellen Goldsmith. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shafiq Fazal. I'm the interim dean of the university libraries. So it's such a pleasure to be here and see this crowd uh, for this event. Um, University Libraries is very proud to be a partner with the Charles B. Wang Center for this event. And also this event is supported in part by the Jacqueline M. Newman Endowed Fund, which is being um, um, uh, provided by Jackie Newman. And we were, sorry for the few minutes late, but we were waiting for Jackie to arrive so she's still in transit, so she'll arrive a, a little bit later. Um, but just a little bit about Dr. Newman. Dr. Newman is a professor emeritus at Queens College, specializing in Chinese cuisine, history, gastronomy, and food culture. Considered a trailblazer in the field, Dr. Newman has authored numerous books on the subject of Chinese cuisine and is the editor-in-chief of Flavor and Fortune, a periodical focusing on the science and art of Chinese cuisine. More than 15 years ago, Dr. Newman gifted us, Stony Brook University Libraries, her personal collection of Chinese cookbooks, which includes over 5,000 volumes. It is an impressive collection, and we have that in our special collection. So we're very thrilled to be showcasing Dr. Newman's uh, collection. And events like this one help us in, in, in promoting uh, more awareness of that collection. This is the largest cookbook collection of its kind in the world. The collection includes numerous journals on the impact of Chinese cuisine, in the areas of nutrition, health, and medicine. Uh, we're very pleased that Dr. Newman hopefully will be here for today's event. Um, so in her absence, I'll ask if you can please join me in thanking her for her remarkable contributions to this field of study and in support of the Stony Brook University Library. Hopefully she'll join us in a little bit later. Now, for our lecturer today, we have Ellen Goldsmith. Uh, Ellen is a licensed acupuncturist, educator, and co-founder of Pearl Natural Health, a naturopathic and Chinese medicine clinic in Portland, Oregon. She is a graduate of the National University of Natural Medicine's College of Classical Chinese Medicine and holds an MS in Oriental Medicine where she currently teaches. She is certified in Chinese herbal therapy. Um, Alan is the author of Nutritional Healing with Chinese Medicine, 
and it's over 175 recipes for optimal health. She has hosted the podcast Health Current Radio and radio show Health Watch on Pacifica Radio. We're very thrilled and excited that Ellen is able to join us today and uh, to be here at the Wang Center and also on our lovely campus at Stony Brook University. So please join me in welcoming Alan Goldsmith. Thank you, Dr. Ellen. Thank you, Dr. Very good. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fazil, for that lovely introduction. And I'd like to thank Jin Yong Jin for inviting me to come here and spend time with you. And her assistant, Ellen Yu, who made all the little details work out just perfectly. And and to you for taking the time out of your day to come spend with me and learn something about Chinese nutritional healing. Um, I just, before I start, I'd just like to see a show of hands from people. Um, anybody out here find dietary advice kind of confusing? Just <laughs> raise your hand. If you, okay, a number of you, right? Have any of you changed your diet based on dietary advice that you either read on the internet or a friend told you about or a doctor? Anybody out there? Okay, how many have done that more than once? More than twice? Okay, you can see, right? It's, uh, it can be quite confusing. And I, I get it, I've been there in that kind of, what I call like a nourishing sort of limbo. You know, because diets get to work for us for a while, and then somehow they stop working. And why is that? Well, I think it's because we change, and our needs change. And, um, what I want to say is that there are some solutions to this confusion, and those solutions are rooted in Chinese medicine, in nature, which Chinese medicine is based upon, and you. And you say, well, why me, right? I mean, I've been trying all these different things and I can't find the answer. Well, I say it's rooted in you because you actually are experts in eating, because you eat every day of your life, right? And you also have senses. You taste, you smell, you're out there in the world, so you feel, like Jin Young Jin said, um, the change of season, and you put on a jacket, or you change your food a little bit. But what if you could learn a little bit of a foundation in Chinese nutritional therapy and medicine, which I'm gonna impart to you today, um, and engage with those foundations as soon as you leave the room. So you're saying, God, how am I going to do that? And Chinese medicine is very complex, and of course I can't teach you all the ins and outs of it in less than an hour, but I can give you some things that you'll be able to utilize for yourself when you go back to your kitchen or when you sit down to eat. And um, there's a Chinese proverb that I think I really want to have you remember. And it says, and it says, those who neglect their diet waste the skill of a good physician. Because we know that a lot of uh, health issues these days are caused by bad food, and we know a lot of these things are preventable. Of course, you know, when one in three people born after the year 2000 are going to develop diabetes and heart disease, you know, that's a problem. So how can we utilize food in a way that supports our health and vitality? And Chinese nutritional or diet, I like to say dietary therapy because diet is a way of eating and nutrition. I think in the West we think about that more of like, you know, calories and vitamins and minerals, etc. So it's really based on the principles of Chinese medicine and the principles of Chinese herbalism. And that premise is that there's a therapeutic potency in food. And that it's actually utilized in ways that are very specific to each of us and to the stage of life that we're in. And changing the way we eat, I, I get it, it's not easy. I mean, I work with people every day um, on health issues that I believe and I've seen over my decades of practice can be very improved simply improved by changing the food they eat. And I always say that, you know, changing the way we eat is hard. 
But if we simply change the way we eat and we feel better, and we haven't taken medicine or done a whole bunch of other kinds of things, we go, wow, that was simple. You know, how can food have that impact? So I just want to give you a little bit of background. In Chinese medicine and culture, there's been a, a very close connection with food and healing that's been well documented for over 2,500 years. And it's been documented in certain classic Chinese medicine texts, such as the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine, the Shennong Ban Sao, and um, the Neijing. And there's a legendary herbalist, Sun Simiao, who always spoke of and documented a lot of information on food and herbs because there's a tradition in Chinese medicine called um, nurturing life. And that to nurture life, we want to pre prevent harm and promote health. And he did that through the food that we eat. There's also a, a saying in Chinese medicine that food and medicine sh say, share the same origin. And in Chinese culture, there's a saying that uh, food heals and medicine is food, and the two are inseparable. And that's not something we really think about in the West. So if you've grown up in a culture, let's say you were lucky enough that your parents or your grandparents imparted to you a certain wisdom about food, kind of common sense, like Jin Young said, you know, it's cold out, so now I start having some ginger tea to prevent myself from getting colds. And ginger itself, as a food, is antimicrobial, antibacterial, it's good for the stomach, it warms us up. So she maybe didn't know all those details, but she knows inherently that ginger is going to warm her up, make her feel better a little bit, and it has that placebo effect of like, oh, it's going to protect me a little bit too. So um, if you've grown up with those traditions, they can stay with you and you can pass them down. But the good news is we can also create our own traditions, and I hope that I get to impart to you that today. So a little bit about me. This is me when I was 15 at my high school, Uniondale High School on Long Island, so I'm a Long Island girl. And how did I get from there to here? You know, I grew up kind of semi-normal, a little rebellious. Um, but you know, I ate a regular American diet. I was lucky enough, my mom and my grandma cooked a lot, so I ate a lot of good healthy kind of food. Uh, but I also ate a lot of hot dogs and hamburgers and brisket, and, you know, Jewish food, strudel, and then I had lots of white bread and ice cream and Carvel ice cream. Does Carvel ice cream still exist on Long Island? It does, wow. Uh, you know, I was just a typical kid, but by the time I got to college, I wasn't feeling that great. My energy wasn't that great, and I was kind of looking around. And I started playing around with being a vegetarian and did that for a long time. But I ate a lot of cheese and I just kind of survived on snacks. Fruits and nuts, apples, you know that? You don't sit down and eat, you kind of grab and quote a healthy food and go on your way. But I didn't feel that good. So then I tried veganism and then I discovered macrobiotics, which taught me a lot about cooking and the energy of food. And that really turned me around. But then when I started studying Chinese medicine and learning you know, more foundational principles, I started to be able to understand how I could adapt food for myself in a way that was supportive for myself at that stage of my life. And um, I kind of exited a nourishing limbo. And I just want to impart to you a very simple and straightforward manner that can help you think about nourishment and food in a way that's dynamic and that can work for you. And the good news is you really can do it. So today I'm going to talk to you about three things, these three foundations. One is what we call the thermal nature of food. Can food warm or cool you? And that's impact on our body. I'm going to talk to you about flavor, not just the yumminess that we experience when we eat something, but the impact that flavor has, the therapeutic action that it actually has on our body. And that's a very strong parallel with Chinese herbalism. And then the third thing I want to talk to you about is eating seasonally. And as I did in my book when I um, created these recipes, I really thought about with my co-recipe developer, you know, what's the best way to do this for people to access it? And we really came up with that all of us live through the seasons. We all know what it's like to be in summer, winter, spring, or fall, right? 
So that's how we organize them. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And then I'm going to introduce some concepts about yin and yang, because that, is, of course, is the foundation of Chinese medicine. And then at the end, I hope we have some time to answer your questions, OK? And then we'll be doing a book signing out front so that you can come and participate in. But first, before you start to add in those good things, you've got to get rid of the clutter, OK? You've got to get rid of those foods that do nothing for you. Those processed foods, those junk foods, those things that you just grab and go with, those foods that you can't understand what the ingredients are in, they don't do anything for us. They kind of stimulate us, that's what they're meant to do, but they don't nourish us. They're not grown under the sun. We want food that is grown under the sun. We want lots of vegetables, we want lots of fruits, we want nuts and seeds, we want beans and pulses, we want good quality animal food. We want all of these things. In Chinese uh, dietary therapy, we also talk about condiments, those things that add palatability to food, that make food more yummy, that make them more digestible, that actually um, add a little pizzazz to our life, and that those condiments are not like the ketchup and mustard you see in, in Western and American culture, but things like salt, spice, tea, fragrant flowers, herbs and spices, etc. So like I said, you know, you go and you do a diet, and they work. Every diet will work for a little while, okay? But it's confusing because there are a lot of different diets out there. I haven't even listed the newer ones like keto and all these other kinds of diets. But sometimes a lot of people just give up and they order in, right? And the reality is, is that there was a study done and 52% of Americans said that it's easier to do their taxes than to change the way they eat, which is a shocking, I think it's a shocking statistic. And that as Americans, we spend less time eating than anywhere else in the, in the world. And we spend less time cooking than anywhere else in the world. Now, cooking is a skill, so it's something we all can learn to do. But I just wanted to let you know, if you're having these problems, you're not alone, okay? So just remember, food connects us to nature. Because if we're eating food that has been grown or raised under the sun, we are connected to nature. We're eating the food that has been nourished by the soil. That's why the quality of our soil is so important to our health. We're eating, if we're eating animal food, we're eating animal food that's been raised. So it's so important what animals are eating, right? So we are all connected to nature through the food that we eat. And the beautiful thing is we do that every day. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the difference between Western dietary therapy and Chinese dietary therapy, because they're, they're a little bit different in their approach and they also share many similarities. And that's my passion about Chinese dietary therapy is that you can overlay. It's not one or the other. You know, we kind of live in that world right now. It's this or that. And it isn't this or that. It's a circle. Everything is connected. So you can use some of the things that I give you today as an overlay to Western dietary therapy to help kind of heighten and exalt your understanding. So of course, thank goodness now we're eating a plate from the USDA as opposed to the pyramid. I think that's very good progress. Um, but Western Dietary Therapy thinks about the good quality food, like I just mentioned. It thinks about macro and micronutrients. It thinks about evidence-based research. So you can see many different studies that come out. I think there was, I didn't read the article, but last week there was a study about um, red meat is good for you. You know, where it's like, well, it wasn't good for you. And, you know, so there are lots of different studies. So that the nutritional recommendations are made on, many of them are made on studies, okay? Um, and they also talk about eliminating those, what I call, obstacles to cure. Those foods, like we saw the guy in the, you know, in the supermarket basket, you know, where they don't really do much things for you, right? So if you're having high cholesterol and high blood pressure, they're going to tell you to stay away from saturated fat or trans fats. Uh, high levels of salt, etc. Okay, so these are all really, really good things. There are diets, of course, that are recommended based on your health condition to help improve the condition. But I think years ago when my husband and I were at a um, 
diabetes walk in um, Portland. We were promoting a clinic and we had a program for people with diabetes. We were kind of shocked at the food that they were serving at the diabetes fair. You know, it was pretty high fat. It was refined <coughs> carbohydrates. Um, it, and which refined carbohydrates turn to sugar, which turns to fat. You know, it, there weren't a lot of vegetables, so, you know, it's interesting, I find. Okay? But there's a lot of value in it, and we can use it in conjunction. Chinese dietary therapy, this is a kanji that we made in one of my classes. The kanji is like a rice soup. It's very easy to make, and um, it's very easy to digest, and we were garnishing it, and some of my students decided they want to put goji berries, which are um, a little sweet, uh, some chives and almonds, and uh, some red dates in there. Chinese dietary therapy is based on the same thing in Western dietary therapy, whole foods, all the food groups, etc., cetera, um, eliminating those obstacles to cure. But there are a couple of things that are different, and that is the thermal nature, or the qi of food. The thermal nature is a food, it's not whether you cook it or don't cook it, but the inherent nature of that food is going to be more warming or cooling or more neutral or more hot or cold, and that's going to have an impact on us. It also talks about, like I said earlier, flavor and the therapeutic action that flavor has in us. We use the five flavors, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and pungent, aromatic, and I'll talk about that later too, and then eating seasonally. And that is all premised on promoting the balance within our body so that we improve our quality, our capacity to self-regulate ourselves and to be healthy and to generate health within ourselves. And that's what we call the balance of yin and yang. So yin and yang, you've all seen this. As my colleague acupuncturist says to me, you know, yin and yang is not a poster in your dorm room. Yin and yang is what we experience every day. We can't experience the day without night. We can't experience the night without day. Everything turns into its opposite, right? We're little babies, we become old. <laughs> We're active, we need to rest. We're hungry, we eat, we digest. These are all elements of yin and yang in the body. Yin, which is related to like the shady side of the hill, is the aspect that cools us and moistens us, it nourishes us, it's our blood, it's our fluids in our body. Yang is the sunny side of the hill, the dry side, the activating side. It's the sun shining in your window in the morning and giving you up and getting you going and activating you and warming you and drying you. And we need that balance of yin and yang in the body because if we're too active and we're too hot, and we're too dry, we kind of dry up or burn out, right? But if we're too, we're, if we're too cold and damp and phlegmatic or lethargic, that's not good either. So we can actually use food to help shift the balance of yin and yang in our body. So I want to start, again, the nature of, or chi of food, the flavors of food and the therapeutic actions and about eating seasonally. So let's start with thermal nature. How many of you have ever sat on my seesaw? Anybody? Oh, come on. <laughs> OK, you ever sit on the seesaw and some big person or your brother or sister gets on the other end and shoot, you're way up there and you can't get back down? OK? That's not so good when we're dealing with our health and our energy and food. You know? People struggle with like just eating in a certain way and then at one point they just go, I've had enough, I've got to change it. Anybody ever been there? Yeah, okay, we all, many of us that have. And so then we have to work really hard, just like that seesaw, to get back. So thermal nature is very important in the body. And we want to exist, okay, I got this fancy thing here. We want to exist more like right here at the fulcrum because it's much easier to balance there than it is to go from one extreme to the other, okay? Um, you can see that in like barbecue. You eat a lot of hard barbecue and then you need a really cold beer, you need some ice cream or something like that. Like hot and cold, hot and cold. But 
The neutral is where we want to live, and that's where we do if we eat a whole foods diet. Beans, nuts and pulses, um, legumes, um, many vegetables are neutral in their thermal nature. I mean, they're just balancing in, in what they do in our body. Um, some meats are such as that as well. Warming is going to be things that are going to activate our digestion, make our digestive system work, warm us up, keep us warm. Cooling foods are going to be able to calm us down a little bit, um, clear some heat, what we say in Chinese medicine, soothe the liver, make us feel more relaxed. We usually utilize hot and cold therapeutically because that's strong, that's a strong shift in temperature. So hot foods we use for people who are very, very cold and, and, and sometimes weak. And those, we say, hot foods are going to vivify the yang, really wake up the fire in our body, really bring that heat and just kind of like ignite the fireplace in the body. Cold foods are going to, and I'm not talking about ice cream and beer and all those things, but I'll, talk, I'll show you in a, bit, in a minute. But therapeutically, cold foods are going to help clear heat that builds up. Some people just are hot. They're red-faced, they, they can't calm down, they're just really, really um, agitated all the time. That's a lot of stagnation and heat in the body. So we use those cold foods to help detoxify, clear heat, and calm things down a little bit. And you can see here, you have them in your handouts. Um, I gave you a whole list of foods in each category so that when you go home you can kind of like look and you can say, hey, what category do I eat in mostly, okay? So I had once a student in one of my classes um, and I noticed in our, one of our retreats when we were cooking is that he added pepper to everything. And I'm not just talking black pepper, I'm talking he wanted to add habanero, he wanted to add jalapeno, he even wanted to add ghost pepper, so, okay. Uh, what if you just took the pepper back a little bit or took it out and see if we could add some other spices and see what that would be like? Well, my student left, you know, and we had like breaks between our, our weekends and um, I always give my students something for them to take with them from the, the retreat weekend and to work on for a few weeks and then to just come back and let us know what happens. Not to try to be good or do it right, but just to see what, what they discover. Well, when this student returned three weeks later, he really looked different. I, I couldn't believe it. He just looked different. And so I said, so what, what happened, you know, over these three weeks? He said, I can focus. I'm not so agitated. Um, my wife likes me better. Um, and um, he really had a huge change in his life just from taking out the pepper. Because he was putting pepper in everything. Right? So that's... That's a kind of a tell that there's something out of balance. So we can utilize foods if we want to move the direction of warming or cooling in our body strongly in one way or another. And we can also use them in such a way as to help keep and promote balance. So again, we want to think about if you're a warm person, it's not that you're not going to need warming foods. You do. You always need both. But you're not going to need those foods that make you hot and are very, very stimulating. But if you're a cold person, you of course will need some cooling foods, but you want to make sure you're not going into the grab-and-go all the time and drinking ice-cold water all the time and just having cold food all the time. You want to see where can I bring in some balance, where can I be more intentional, in my um, use of foods. And now I want to talk to you about flavor. Because flavor, again, we all have like flavor preferences. And they're really important to acknowledge and to honor. But we want to make sure that we're not like getting our sweets just from chocolate and candy and cookies and refined carbohydrates. We want to explore the possibility of sweetness in food. Like meat is sweet. And that's an interesting thing, right? But there is a sweetness in food, in meat. There's a sweetness in carrots. There's a sweetness in uh, snack peas. There's a sweetness in grains and beans and nuts and seeds. 
And all the sweet foods have an action. Their thermal nature is mostly neutral, so they're not going to warm or cool us. They're going to nourish us. They're very, the sweet flavor is very important for young children because their, their digestive network is, is, um, is developing, their, their immune system is developing, and the sweet flavor is nourishing, what we say in Chinese medicine, to the stomach and spleen, to the digestive system. So we want to give them good quality sweet food, not sugar. It's the worst thing you can give your kid, because once you give your kid sugar, like when they're little, they're hooked. I said I lost the battle in preschool when my daughter's teachers gave, started giving them candy and goldfish and all this other stuff. Like, ah. And um, she loves her sugar, my daughter. Um, it's also very calming, it's the sweet flavor. And we know that just um, from extreme sweet flavor from dessert. You know, when everyone has dessert after a meal, they kind of zone out, right? You know? So um, it's very calming. And so we need the sweet flavor in our diet. Pungent and aromatic. One of my favorite categories. Because there's pungent, like garlic, uh, like ginger, like alliums, leeks, onions, scallions, chives, all of those things. Um, peppermint, etc. And that flavor, the movement of that flavor is up and out. It can help disperse things, like uh, cold with heat. Uh, peppermint is very cooling. It helps bring the energy up and out and disperse any kind of buildup of heat in the body. But the aromatic spices, those things that you find in your kitchen cabinet, are really um, so therapeutic and so useful. And it doesn't matter what cultural tradition you're from, your ancestors knew about them. And so it's time to start using them again and putting them into your food. Like a sweet, uh, making rice, which is, like I said, inherently sweet, if you add um, a cinnamon stick in, into it, it probably enhances the sweetness of the rice, but it also adds a depth of flavor and a warming aspect, because cinnamon is a, an aromatic, pungent, warming spice that is very good for the kidneys. Adding in basil, which is pungent and warming and good for the digestive system, will add a different kind of flavor into a very simple bowl of rice. So using those aromatic and pungent, aromatic kind of moves more in the center of the body, warming the digestion, and the pungent helps things move up and out. Sour, that flavor that we see so abundantly in summer with the berries. You know, I live in Oregon now, which is like, you guys should just come out and eat the fruit in the summer. It's so good, you know? It's really, really good. The berries and the peaches and the nectarines and all of those. They have a sweet and sour. You know when we eat sour, how like our mouth gets a little, we pucker up, right? And we get that saliva in the mouth. It actually promotes the uh, secretion of body fluids and it helps hydrate us. So that sour flavor kind of brings the energy into the body, hydrates us and moistens us. And it's something we also need in uh, the autumn season when it's starting to get a little dry outside. We're spending more time inside. So that sour flavor, like in rose hips, uh, which you can find in the fields, Ooh, uh, hibiscus, um, dried hibiscus, uh, plums, and I mean not plums, pe uh, pears and apples have a certain sweet and sour aspect too. So it's, it contains, it helps bring the energy in, it moistens, it activates us. And the bitter flavor, which is I think the most malign flavor in Western culture anyway, if you are from an Asian background and you're lucky enough to have, you know, a mama or auntie or somebody, I'm sure that you've had some really bitter foods in your life. Like bitter melon, this food here on the, on the right, this one here. Probably the most bitter food you can find. There's even a whole website on it, momortica.com. And uh, bitter melon is purely bitter. And it's used a lot um, to detoxify, clear heat, bring down cholesterol. Um, it's also used in the treatment of diabetes. Um, and traditionally, it would be cooked either with shrimp, black bean, or pork to kind of mitigate these, these really strong, bitter flavor. Also, in my book, I have some recipes with that, but also we, we make that uh, a bitter melon chutney with tomato and miso, which is quite delicious. You know, when you mix the flavors, you kind of moderate it. 
But in our culture, we know about bitter from coffee, chocolate, and beer, right? And, and, and tea. These are all bitter flavor foods. Um, but bitter is the coldest flavor, and so it has a very strong um, potency to detoxify and clear heat. Um, and it helps to purge and move things down, downward in the body. We can see those foods too in our, just in the Western culture, in escarole, chicory, endive, radicchio, um, yellow grapefruit, um, hops, cardoons, artichokes, white asparagus. All these foods are very bitter in flavor. Olives are bitter too, but you know, has anyone ever eaten a raw olive? It's, it's shocking, isn't it? It's so bitter and so hard to eat, but you, you brine them in salt so it kind of moderates that bitter flavor. It makes it more palatable. Therefore, salt is a condiment to help bring palatability to a food. And finally, the salty flavor that we not only see in salt, but in and miso and tamari and all that, but you have in sea vegetables, seaweeds. Again, a kind of lost food in a modern American culture. But all traditional cultures and all cultures that live by the sea have always eaten seaweed. I have a dear friend in France who operates a seaweed camp every summer off the coast of Brittany, harvesting seaweeds. And it's, you know, it's, it is a traditional food used in Ireland, Mexico, of course, uh, Japan, China. But all coastal um, cul um, cultures have eaten sea vegetables. They're rich with um, many minerals, so it's a great way to get calcium and magnesium and iron, etc. And that's what you see on the left here. That's, uh, I think, an arame salad. So salty is very cooling in its thermal nature. It's in, so it's going to help promote our, when I say, the body fluids. It's going to support our kidney function. And supporting the kidney function means we're able to filter and send things to the bladder so we can urinate and get rid of it. Um, and we're also, that it can go to the kidney and help the kidney send body fluids to the rest of the body. So it has that twofold. Um, purpose there. So this is one of my favorite um, sayings of um, songs from the figure of the birds made of things in the 60s to everything turn turn. There is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Well, that's what I think about how we eat. To everything turn turn, there is a season. And um, if we the beautiful thing about eating seasonally is that we can change as we move through each season. And the seasons give us an opportunity to change over and over and over again, kind of recreating some part of ourselves as we go through our life. And I also like to think about it as in, in terms of movement. So this is just this beautiful quote that we had this intimate relationship between the activity and life of ourselves and our natural environment. And again, through seasonal eating, that's one way that we can really support our health. But in this slide here, you can see this circle. Um, are any of you familiar at all with Chinese medicine? I'm just curious, anybody? Okay, teeny little bit. But um, in Chinese medicine, we talk about the five phases, but for our purposes, we're talking about the four seasons. And I'll talk about earth in, in a moment. But there's a movement to the seasons. So like I said earlier, and you know, in autumn, we start to bring in our energy. We start to organize ourselves differently. We put a jacket on. Our food changes a little bit. We start to contain the energy, that exuberance of summer. And if we've been so exuberant all summer, and we've eaten really cooling foods, and we just like aren't ready for the cold, cooling winds of autumn, then we're cold, right? So we have to let go of the past. I mean, we have to let go of summer. I know it's sad, it's gone, right? So that we can stand in the present of autumn and be able to interact with it, stay warm enough, stay hydrated enough, protect ourselves from getting sick, and then prepare ourselves to get to move into winter. So it's a constant dance. You're never kind of like in one place, you know? You're constantly moving. And that way, you can, the way you can do it is through your food, because of course the weather changes a lot. So in autumn, we start to gather, we start to harvest, we bring energy in, 
In winter, we go deep underground and we start to store. Um, and we say that yin is the keeper of yang. We're going into a place of hibernation. Winter is a time to go inward, to do exercise that's not as sweaty and as demanding, to cultivate what we call in Chinese medicine our qi, our jing, our essence, and to do things and eat in a way that does that. But then that our energy has to burst up and out. We say the yang qi, that activating, motivating sunlight energy, starts to emerge as we go into spring. And we need to be able to sprout out, just like the plants do, from the ground. But we can't if we've just been eating like really heavy, cooked foods, and we're just we're not changing things, and we're kind of dragging the baggage with us from the spring, you know, from the winter, and we get into spring, and we just kind of can't participate, or we get sick, right? Because our, our spring is, as we well say, spring can really hang you up. It's an old jazz song, right? Because you aren't ready for all those changes. Or as my Jewish grandmother said, don't be, a, don't be an idiot, put a jacket on, button it up, you know? Because the weather changes a lot. So we have to be able to move into spring and go into that growth and renewal so that we can get into the exuberance of summer and then move back into fall. But there's this thing in Chinese medicine, as I was taught by my teachers, that earth, that is our resource, is inherent in all seasons. And that as we move from autumn towards winter, there's always this turning point where you go, oh, winter's coming. I can feel it. Or more importantly, it's in winter when we go, oh, I can feel spring's coming. I can feel it. And that's a time to start to change our diet to help us for the next season. So it's a constant dance. And the way that we do that is through flavor and thermal nature. So like I said, that spring, that young chi emerges, and we want flavors that help promote that. So the pungent flavor gets rid of that buildup from the winter. It helps to crack open all that kind of consolidation that's happened, and helps us sprout up and out. But we also want to relax more. We want to be in the air. We want to walk through the, the morning and see the, the green coming out of the trees and the ground. So that sweet flavor, that, as I said, is calming and relaxing and harmonizing. We need that flavor, too. As we go into summer and all of that exuberance and all of our, as we say, all of our pores are open so that we can fully interact. You know, we just let that sunlight in and we just, we just want it, right? We just want to feel that on our bodies. We want to also be sure that we're keeping things fluid. So the pungent flavor, the warming, and the cooling are good. Warming like a little cayenne's okay, a little pepper's okay. But also we want to have the pungent and cooling like the mint and the lavender and the lemon balm and um, that's it for now. Um, but we also have that bitter, so we don't get too hot in the summer, that we get to urinate some of that bitter out of our body, with the cold bitter, like I talked about greens earlier, and that sour flavor from, the, from the, the fruits that help to hydrate us. And then, like I said, there's that seasonal pivot that happens all the time, and that, that's, that is important to recognize in all the seasons. And that earth element is best supported by the sweet flavor and the neutral flavor. So that's why the whole grain, you know, whole grain, whole food, fresh fruits and vegetable diet, nuts and seeds, etc., can be inherent throughout the year. And then we move into autumn where we need to gather and bring in, but we also need to protect ourselves. But not like, mm, like that, but protect ourselves in a way that just keeps like we say in Chinese herbal medicine, the jade screen a little bit out here. So that when people are sick, we don't get it. All right? So those foods that are more slowly cooked, soups keeping us hydrated, some uh, water-based like braising uh, cooking techniques, um, using foods that will moisten and protect us. Uh, pears are, I'll give you a little tip here, Pears, poached pears, baked pears with some ginger um, is really good for um, 
Actually, poaching them with ginger and some lemon is really good if you have a cough. Hairs are cooling, they're moistening, they have an affinity for the lungs, and they help to break up phlegm. So that's a really nice um, little autumn trick. And then winter, which is a real heaven and earth shut down and go into a stage of storage, and water turns to ice, and the earth splits open, and the yang chi of nature stays unperturbed. The yang chi of nature stays unperturbed. That means we don't want to like burst out of our shell yet. We want to bring that back in. We want to go into hibernation like the bears, like the seeds that are deep underground. It thinks nothing's happening out here, but it's actually one of the most important times of the year. And with climate change, we know this to be true. Because if it doesn't get cold enough, the trees and plants just don't know what they're doing. So we need that. We need that with our bodies too. We, you know, take that opportunity for yourself, especially in this time, you know, just so you can kind of go back and regenerate yourself. So we want to adjust the nature of foods eaten, eaten according to your conditions. So if you're a cold person, use that handout I gave you and play around with um, thermal nature and see where you can add in some things. Change your cooking styles. Learn how to cook a little bit so you can make food for yourself to meet what you need. Adjust the five flavors and foods to support your health. One of the best ways to do it is when you put your plate out, is if you can have all the colors, red or orange, uh, yellow, white or beige, blue or black, and green, on your plate you will have a very balanced plate. And also if you have all the five flavors in your meal. You may have a very simple meal of some vegetables and grain and a little meat, but if you have a little side condiment of like a fermented um, sauerkraut or a little seaweed or some kind of, it doesn't have to be a lot, just a little bit that kind of surprises you with flavor, and you have those five flavors on your plate, you'll feel a lot more satisfied. And that's really important. You want to be healthy, but you also want pleasure from food. And then looking with those flavors to work with the seasons so that you can adjust flavor to meet um, the need and the activity of the season. And then I just want to leave you with this because this is really, really interesting. Because, you know, we think about recipes, and I look for recipes on the internet when I'm like, oh, what am I going to make with this, you know, um, sometimes. But if you go back to the origin of the word, the origin from the 1580s was medical prescription, and it's still alive today. That whole thing that you see on the pad, you know, your prescription pad that says RX, medical prescription was for food. So, um, and I love that the, the second um, definition was to take and that it was always written by physicians as the head of prescriptions but it always meant the instructions for preparing foods. So when you make a recipe you can actually make it a medicinal or therapeutic and delicious recipe. So I want to share one recipe with you from my book. Well this is just one day I made some roasted vegetables. We're getting into that season and this is just roasted carrots, parsnip squash with purple onion and some thyme and oil and salt. And that is a really simple dish. You just put a little oil and salt and herbs and you put it in the oven. Um, you cut them into big chunks or thin slices, however you like them. Have so you have a texture to food because mouthfeel is also a very important part of eating. Um, and those of you who have children or picky eaters know that that is really important, right? Um, so that's just a really nice and simple dish to make. And this is a recipe um, that I adapted from Nina Simon's book. And it's actually based on an uh, ancient um, Chinese herbal prescription that used lamb bone dongwei, which is a um, Chinese herb that's what we call it the women's ginseng. It's used to nourish the blood, move the blood, and warm us, and ginger. And um, so lamb is also a very important meat for women. It's very warming, it nourishes the blood and the kidneys, the reproductive organs. So women who are very cold and have um, menstrual irregularities, amenorrhea means 
transferential irregularity, or even some issues um, depending on your condition on fertility. It helps to kind of revitalize and restore um, that when it's health there. So when you add the lamb with the ginger and the dung whey, you're kind of exalting the function of the lamb. It's a very warming dish. It's very delicious. Um, and we use things you can see that are quite warm, like Sichuan peppercorns and garlic and cinnamon stick and whole star anise. But it gives it a depth of flavor and a roundness of flavor that makes it very, very satisfying. And then you add in some butternut squash that is neutral and sweet and nourishing and some Swiss chard that's a little uh, pungent and sweet and cooling and you kind of have a pretty balanced dish more on the warming side but not something that's going to overheat you and um, I usually cook this for like three to four hours and so it just kind of you know all melt it melts together the, the lamb and the herbs etc and it's a very wonderful dish to have in the middle of winter if it's really cold outside. So, you want to eat those vegetables. You want to, you know, if there's anything that you can do from today that I would say is if you can add more green leafy vegetables to your life, your body will be super happy. So, consider the chia food. Is it going to warm you? Is it going to cool you? Consider the flavor. Try something new. Just Get out there and try a new vegetable a week. Consider the season you're in. If you don't know how to cook, there are lots of places you can learn really simple things, even online these days you can do it. And um, what else did I want to say about that? Yeah, and eat in, try to see about eating in, in sync with the seasons. You know, when you leave here, don't quote change anything right away, but maybe start to notice what you're doing. Oh my gosh, I'm always going to the grab and go. I'm always eating cold food. Or, wow, I never like to cook. Or, wow, my, my food is always sweet. Or my food is always spicy or something. Just start to notice because as you develop your own uh, powers of observation and kind of attune yourself to the energy of food, you'll be able to make better choices for yourself that you can be your own guide as you go forward in your life. And then, as the Chinese say, Chi Yao, which is eat your medicine, eat your food, and I really hope that today you have gotten something out of this, and um, I'd love to take any of your questions, if you have any. Yes? Okay. <laughs> Uh, reading your thermal nature of foods mm -hmm. chart, only one thing that stands out is the uh, dry ginger is belong to a hot category, and fresh ginger is warm. Mm -hmm. Is there any other foods such as pepper, a uh, pepper mixed mm -hmm. fresh and the dried, is that any difference? Yes, that's a great question. Did everyone hear her? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, when you dry some food, you concentrate its um, flavor for one, so the flavor becomes more concentrated. But to dry it, you also have to heat it up. So just by the nature of cooking something and drying it, um, you're going to change a little bit its thermal nature. There's a practice in Chinese herbalism called baozi, where you prepare herbs. You'll pan fry, you'll do it with honey, you'll roast, You'll do many different things that can actually change the nature of food. So yes, when you have a, a raw pepper, like a green or a red pepper, that's going to be sweet in its flavor. I think it's pretty neutral in its thermal nature. Um, but there are different kinds of pepper, right? So that's like a red bell pepper, right? But if you have uh, all those different other kinds of peppers, chili peppers, Sichuan peppers, um, abanero, etc. Those have a different thermal nature to them, inherent in their raw state or in their cooked state. But whenever you dry it, you concentrate flavor, um, etc. You may, and the thermal nature will change slightly. Because usually when you dry chili peppers, you just hang them up. You don't put them in the oven to roast them. Because if you roast them, well, they'll, they'll, they actually can lose a little bit of their 
their their um, fire. Some of them, not all of them, but so yes, by cooking and drying, you will enhance. Uh, you will make something inherently warmer, and you will concentrate its flavor. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, sure. Um, you mentioned, of course, that uh, heat food is medicine. Mm -hmm. But is the underlying theory that the proper diet uh, prevents disease and or restores health? from a diseased state, if you could elaborate on that. Sure, those are two very different things. Like, of course, if we eat well, if we eat, quote, a proper diet, which is different for each of us, um, it is the great preventative cure, you know, it is a great prevention to disease. But inherent in being alive is that we all have weak links, you know? And even the best diet sometimes cannot prevent disease, um, unfortunately, you know. Um, so, yes, good food is great prevention. And good food changes as we change. And I think that's really, really important because at different stages of life, we have different needs. If you're a young athlete, your needs are different than if you're a young mother. And they're different than if you're a perimenopausal woman or a menopausal. You know, so your your whole constant condition changes, so your food has to change. To restore health from using food as medicine, to restore one from a disease state, is of course a bit more complex and dependent on your condition and the disease, etc. But it does we have seen it, I have seen it over and over again, just working with thousands of people over decades, that you can improve one's health outcomes. Um, can you, quote, cure disease? Depends what it is, but you can manage it. And I think what, that's what's beautiful about food is that you can actually manage symptoms in a way like in, allergies, for one. There are certain foods that can, act, that can um, aggravate allergy symptoms. And when you take those foods away, and some people, those allergy symptoms go away. Or like I've had patients with chronic migraines, and when they take certain foods away, the migraines go away. I mean, intractable migraines. I'm not just talking like bad things. You know, 20 years ER, etc. You take a certain food away, they go away. You put the food back, it comes back. So that puts you in the driver's seat, right? You get to manage your health by saying, okay, you know, if I have that chocolate and wine, which was one of my patient's triggers, you know, I'm going to be in my bedroom for three days with a migraine. And that's up to me. Do I want that or not? You know what I'm saying? She wanted it because it was her daughter's birthday that fell on Valentine's Day, and that's what she did on Valentine's Day. So, okay. Um, but, of course, the more complex disease states, you know, cancer, Crohn's disease, things like that are much more complicated and need to be worked with on an individual basis. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, quick question on the the different flavors. What kind of meat would be sweet? Uh, beef, lamb, chicken are sweet. Uh, pork is a little bit more salty, and as is duck. Duck is a little bit more salty. And it's like, yeah. One more question. Yeah. As an acupuncturist, do you ever hear a Nate? Nayet? N A E T? Yeah, that's a Zero. whole. Yeah, that's a whole. I don't. I'm not that familiar with it, but I know. I know what it is. It's a way of desensitizing someone to um, foods that pro provoke certain symptoms in people. Yeah. Another question here. Sure. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk today. Sure. Uh, so. Like in modern society, human created cold medicine, and that's the medicine. That's also the the part, um, like the form of chemical that enhance the body's metabolism, right? So, do you recommend taking cold medicine when you're sick? Do you take? Uh, do you recommend taking medicine with the good food, or you think good food, like having good quality of food, is good enough for getting better? Right. So she's asking if you're sick and you have a cold. 
Um, do you take cold medicine and good food, or is good quality food enough? Well, when you're sick, sometimes you need something a little bit stronger. And so you have to look at what, it, what kind of cold medicine are you taking? Like Chinese herbs are like, I just think they rock the house for colds. They, because they don't suppress the symptoms, they help uh, bring what we call the pathogens, or like we call it the wind heat or wind cold out of the body, while, um, and using herbs that may um, uh, reduce the toxic um, the heat, et cetera, of certain viruses. So it's very useful. Now if you take a, a cold medicine over the counter that's more suppressive to symptoms, you know, yeah, no, sometimes we need a relief of symptoms, but there are other ways to do it, and I think food is a great adjunct to that because you can reduce symptoms with food, but when you're sick, you need something a little stronger, so I always recommend people go see an herbalist, you know, Chinese herbalist or something. And then, of course, improving your diet. Like, if you have a cold, it's really a bad idea to have foods like that are super spicy or warming like shrimp, um, alcohol, spicy foods, etc. To have a more simple diet that takes the stress off of your digestive system, like soups, more vegetables, less meat, no dairy or baked goods, you know, things that your your system, because your immune system is trying to fight off something. So you want to, you don't want to make your digestive system kind of work overtime. You want to give it a rest so you can heal. Okay. Yes, I have a comment. Of, uh, could you comment on? Cooked versus raw foods? Yes. And then second, could you make a comment about the new interest in probiotics? Um, so cooked versus raw. You know, I'm a big lover of cooked foods, and you don't have to overcook. Um, because there's this funny thing when you eat raw food, your body goes, hey, I gotta break you down, you know? Because it hasn't been broken down at all. Um, so your digestive system has to actually produce a lot of heat and acid to break down raw food, which I think is a little bit like a, a waste of energy, right? Because, you know, chewing, of course, is a great way to break down food and start the digestive process. But if you're just getting raw food, which is cold, your body has to use a lot of heat to warm, first warm it up and break it down. So even if you just, um, like parboil a vegetable, so it's still crunchy, but it's just slightly broken down, it's going to be easier on the body to digest. People with digestive issues, raw food is really hard for them. Um, probiotics is actually not a new thing, it's a really old thing, and uh, we just have lost touch with it because you have probiotics in a lot of fermented foods, which are in every cultural all of us, no matter what culture we find, go way, way, way back. There's always a fermented product in the diet. So um, because of the overuse of antibiotics and the demineralization of our food and the, you know, eating more refined and processed foods over and over the years, our microflora and our microbiome and our digestive system has just gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. So you know, we take these probiotics. So I would say, yeah, they're a great thing. They're good for our immune system. We know the microbiome and our digestive system is linked like this to our immune system. So, uh, but you want to make sure you're getting really good quality probiotics um, because they're not all equal. But you can also start to learn to make your own yogurt and your own sauerkraut and your own pickles and things like that that have a lot of probiotics in them. There was one other question, I think. Hi. Hi. Do you have any uh, recommendations as far as specific foods or even the method of preparing a food for a nursing mother uh, of two? <laughs> um, so, again, you know, I think the mother's health gets transmitted to her baby, right? So you just want to think about your condition. You know, how are you? How's your digestive system? How's your energy? Um, you know, are you so tired? It's like, oh, I don't want to eat, but I'm hungry. Um, these are all things to consider so that the food that a nursing mother eats nourishes her. I have a whole section in my book on postpartum recipes, um, which are just kind of, I think, in that 
venue. So long cooked broths, um, um, any kind of foods that we call nourish the blood, um, because that's our essence, women, that's our essence. I and mean, your essence is also being transmitted through your milk to your baby. So you want to always make sure that you're nourishing your own essence first. And I would say again, yes, cooked foods are probably better off for you. Um, foods that are hard to digest for the mother are going to be hard for the baby. Um, so I'm not getting too specific because I, you know, everybody's different, you know, but um, teas like fennel tea, um, soups, congees, easy, easy cooked stuff um, that you can digest well, that you enjoy, and that bring you energy. And again, in my book, there, there's a whole section on, on that itself that can be, I think, quite useful. Uh -huh. um, so this isn't a question about food, but like, where did you get? Uh, I can be late, so I'm sorry too if I'm okay. repeating yourself. Um, where did you get your Chinese medicine degree, and like, where can I? Because I'm interested in getting a degree. Oh, so I got my Chinese medicine degree in Portland, Oregon, at the National Noon. University. Noon. 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 Yeah, yeah. It's a school of classical Chinese medicine. Um, yeah, that's where I got my degree, and I loved my program and my teachers. Um, there are a lot of good programs all over the place. Um, so it just depends what, where you want to go in terms of your Chinese medicine training. We did a lot of Qigong and um, herbs, um, and now the program is more developed, so there's a lot of uh, reading of classic texts and Chinese medical language, etc. But it's a very uh, thorough, very good program. It's doctoral level, entry level now. Oh, yeah, I was just looking for other, other schools, because that's like, the only one I really want to go to, and it's across the country, so I'm like, uh... <laughs> I'll talk to you outside. Okay. <laughs> okay. One last, last question. I don't need the money. Okay. Where do you get your Chinese herbs from? What's your concern with pesticides? Very good question, because uh, it's a really big problem in China. Um, what's that place called? There's a place in, in um, Chinatown in New York. Is it Conway? Kampo. Kampo. Is it Kampo? Combo, K -A -N -W -O. Yeah, combo. Um, I think they probably have very good um, quality um, for a Chinese herb store. Uh, classical pearls is another. Um, you have to know what your formula is that you want. The classical pearls, that's my teacher, Heiner Fruhoff, and he sources out all of his herbs. Spring wind herbs, you have to be a practitioner with spring wind herbs. Um, but you do want to always ask that question because um, there are, it's a lot of toxicity in, in the environment in China, but there are also people that do have very good practices and do have organic Chinese herbs. And then there are people in this country that too are raising Chinese herbs. Uh, but you know, it's different because there's a different, you know, you get the chi of the herb from the, from the earth and the ground and, so, and the climate and the altitude and all of that. So, yeah, it's a little different, but I think there's also good quality herbs raised here. But it's a that's a really important point. You always want to ask that question. Have to wrap it up. Yes, I uh, thank, thank you so much for amazing. Thank you for sitting here a postcard which has a recipe to make tea, and also she uh, the book sale and signing will be outside. Thank, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.